So hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Tech Talk Travel uh, first live streaming session on LinkedIn and on Facebook. Uh, we started this session as a collective. It's called the Tech Talk Travel Collective. And the idea behind that is that we're actually discussing with uh, disciplines within our industry the issues that they're currently facing, um, especially given the current times of corona and the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we had a closed session last week with Hoteliers, which was um, a really enlightening session and very informative. Um, and we're still processing all of that data that we accumulated and we'll hopefully share that uh, with some of you or with the public in, in the coming weeks. Um, but this session is live. This is for the vendors. Um, and it's really an opportunity for vendors to discuss issues amongst themselves, but also for other vendors or technology providers in our industry to give them a chance to also hear from the people that are on the session today. So before we get started, what I'd like to do is um, perhaps just um, open with some of my own comments and own statements. I've had to write them down because I wanted to really try to um, kind of paint the scene, if you like, for what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and I think a lot's happening right now at the risk of really overstating the obvious. The world in many ways is enduring quite a surreal moment. Um, and it's something that many of us haven't really experienced before. Jobs are disappearing. Our movements are restricted. The streets are empty. There's no business as usual. And for many of us, actually, there's just no business at all. A lot of us are struggling to make sense of it, endeavoring to control the few controllables, trying to identify the opportunities, performing an inventory of our businesses, investing in what is working and discarding what isn't, um, whilst also connecting with the gratitude or with gratitude of those who are willing to help us. Uh, without minimizing the extreme hardship that most are currently facing, I think it's also important to recognize that we're also in quite a rare moment and it's something that's quite extraordinary. If there is a silver lining in any of it, and I do believe there is, uh, it's that we're being marshaled almost to embrace with a sense of humility that we are just a small part of a much greater whole and that is now incumbent of us to rethink the legacy of what our companies represent and what they aspire to be. So in many ways, and it, it's, it's nothing new, but our actions today will be representative of our reputation tomorrow. Um, and in many ways, this could be considered like a reset, uh, an opportunity to embrace our industry and define our relationships with not only ourselves, but our staff, our clients, and also members of our larger community. So the Tech Talk Travel Collective is about offering leaders in their fields an opportunity to talk amongst their peers openly and discuss their challenges, to offer fresh ideas and hopefully cross-pollinate those ideas to help navigate this um, difficult time. We've intentionally not set the agenda for these discussions, but we rather ask the people who are attending to uh, offer key points and discussion topics that are important to them and that they would like to hear from their peers and to discuss with their peers as they go through this process. So it's a conversation about a number of things, defining our definition of normal, leveraging the current experiences to unite and possibly to a degree reinvent our processes. It's about asking questions, challenging the dominant narrative and our industry biases. Uh, as well as an opportunity to instead, instead listen and identify the potential change that, that can be actualized without minimizing the severity of what is and perhaps what is still to come. This could be our opportunity to create new direction and processes as an industry. So today's guests are some of the most, uh, I think, in integrative thinkers who I believe can add valuable insights to the conversation, not only for the industry at large, but also for our fellow technology providers, um, in order to discuss current challenges and potential coping strategies regarding the COVID-19 crisis. So with that said, um, I'll introduce our guests. The first one being Julie Grieve from uh, Crichton, who is the CEO of Crichton. Julie, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, followed by Moritz Klusmann, who is the CEO and co-founder of a, a Customer Alliance. Moritz, thank yeah. you for joining. Thanks for having me. And we have Mr. Uli Pilau, who is the co-founder of Apaleo. Uli, Uli, nice to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Andre. Hi, everybody. And Sasha Hausman, who is CEO of Busy Rooms and also partner at How's That. Sasha, great to have you on the line. Thank you. Hey, guys. Good to see you. 
And finally, James Bishop, who is with SiteMinder and in charge of global um, partnerships, correct? Director of Global Partnerships, James? Yeah, that's uh, pretty pretty close. Thanks, Andre. And right. uh, thanks for having me here. Good to see you all. Great to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so guys, as I said before, um, the agenda was set up E, with, with the idea that you guys provide us discussion points and talking points. Before we get started, though, I'd like to also just to explain to the audience that it's broken into three sections. First one being managing today. Second one is preparing for tomorrow, uh, followed by consumer behavior. So with that said, let's go into the first one about managing today. And um, I'd like to really kind of start by asking how the panels or the people on this session today are currently communicating with uh, and supporting your existing customers, as well as the potential future customers that you may have lost or um, are on hold, if you like, through the, the current crisis. Um, is there more that could have been done? Um, what were your learnings and takeaways from that? And secondly, what are other ways that you're helping hotels financially through this downturn? without, of course, compromising your own business needs and objectives. So, Julie, perhaps if we start with you, um, how, how would you uh, answer those initial questions? So I think the, the first thing around about communication, as soon as it um, kicked off in the UK and we were a couple of weeks behind everyone else, so watching with horror, but also perhaps denial that it was coming to us, as soon as it became obvious we were going to be shut down, we went to our customers, we gave them a three-month payment holiday and we told them that we were here to help. And then I told my team, no more, stop everything. I don't want any sales messaging going out. I don't. I literally don't want anything apart from over a couple of weeks, we prepared a, a blog around about um, resources. So pulling good and useful resources. And, and that really was the first of our strategy. Our strategy was we moved immediately to we must maintain our customers and so we must be seen to be supportive and understanding that um, they don't have any guests and we have a guest engagement tool and um, that, that went down really well and we did our first customer email, in fact I think it's gone out this morning, uh, talking about some of the things that were coming and um, we have, we're about to go out with a, an offer where we have a stripped back version of our product free to the end of the year. So that's, that's been our, our, um, our strategy, maintain, and then when things get back to normal, be ready for it, but also um, still try to add users to our platform. But one thing, Andre, important to, to, to say, in the stage that we're in in our funding, we're fully funded. We're not reliant on revenue yet. And I do think that made a difference in how I was able to respond. Yeah, absolutely. Hi. James, sorry, Sasha, do you want to say something? No, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, James, obviously from a from SiteMiner's perspective, um, a much larger company, uh, larger larger customer base. Julie uh, is with Crichton, started five years ago, smaller company. Um, how would you see the dynamic versus, say, for example, SiteMinder? How, how has SiteMinder been approaching that that side of it? Yeah, I mean, so from the customer support and communication perspective, it, it, it's pretty similar. Um, but uh, I think, as, as you say, we're we're a little bit more established than 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 a lot of the companies on the on the line, and you know, it, it, it's a bigger ship to turn. Um, but you know, we we I think quite proud of the teams and, and how each of those reacted differently. We very quickly shifted from, a, you know, a, an inbound reactive support to a very much an outbound proactive support. We moved people into, you know, we, we basically increased the size of the customer success team versus, you know, versus a sales team, for example. So the, the whole narrative of the conversation with customers and potentially prospects changed. Um, and then a few days later changed again from, you know, like Julie says, like, okay, we're having a different conversation with potential customers now to, all right, this isn't the right time to be talking to potential customers and let's make sure we're working with our existing customers. Um, as Julie says, like, you know, we're, we're more of a guest acquisition platform and, and, you know, as opposed to, you know, a guest management platform. So whilst there aren't 
guests today, obviously in, in various countries, there actually still are. And in some some regions for SiteMinder are further along in the journey than others. So, you know, it's really working very closely with each of the regional teams and understanding each country exactly how we as a business can help our teams that are trying to support those hotels, be it our customers or, you know, potential customers in the future and, and making sure we have that narrative right. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sasha, f- from your perspective, how how has it been uh, from your side? Because I um, obviously we had uh, you know it's been a challenging year. Let's just say yeah. from the get go, two thousand twenty has been a challenging year. Um, how have you found it as well from your side? Well, on, on two sides, right? Because um, I have busy rooms with my own technology company, and then I'm still a partner in House Ed Partners, which is a venture capital fund that has um, you know about one half of our investments are in travel. Um, our current investments. And when you look at it, really different. I mean, in, on, on, on the travel side uh, with busy rooms, we had, um, you know, two bad instances. Um, we were, you know, we had a large customer called Thomas Cook, um, who um, happened to do not so well end of last year. We recovered from that and moved right into Corona right after we got out of that issue. Um, so it's been challenging. Um, you know, I, I wish I had a little bit more time to prepare for Corona. And, and also, I wish I would have taken it a bit more serious. Right? I mean, um, I do business in Asia. Um, I should have really paid more attention. I should have really taken it a bit more seriously. And, you know, I'm not proud to, to share, but um, I have to share. I was one of those that was really disappointed that ITB was canceled. Because I thought that was, you know, overdoing it. Um, you know, in hindsight, um, I'm glad that um, that ITB Berlin actually did, uh, because we probably would have extrapolated and uh, multiplied um, the germs you now throughout the show. So from from that side, um, the same as you know, as as my two previous uh, speakers, uh, we try to help customers. I'm a bit more selfish um, because we do offer solutions that help customers with future sales. Um, so our transaction machine hasn't completely stopped. We do see bookings for 2021 in leisure locations. So we can't entirely um, holiday payments simply because, you know, I'm not in the lucky position that I can send all my staff home. I mean, all staff has volunteered to, to payment cuts and they've been really, really supportive. Times like this show you how good your team is and how loyal your team is and a, you know, great thank you for those that have joined me today on the call here but also those that are not here today that you know in, in supporting the company to get over it um but i you know we we are talking to hotels i mean there's no point in uh, chasing a dead horse right um you know you, you won't chase it um, you will overrun it simply because you'll be faster anyway so you know we we talk to customers uh, you know we're trying to be understanding uh, luckily we have quite a few customers that can pay and they just pay and when we talk to them and say, look, we can't pay. We want to support you because we need to work with you after the crisis. And the rest of the team is is preparing for, you know, the event afterwards. Um, I'm not one of the pessimistic sides. So, you know, this is crisis number five in travel since I've joined travel. Um, and uh, the, the, the good news is travel is a bit more prepared for this than any other industry, simply because, you know, every time that a disruption happens and may it be a, you know, for me, it started with the dot-com bust in 2000 or a September 11th or a swine flu or a SARS or a volcano erupting somewhere, we, you know, travel is immediately affected. So I think we're a bit more prepared and a bit more relaxed when it comes to that. Um, you know, as an investor, you know, 50% of what we do is in other industries. And so uh, there we have anything from big catastrophes up all the way up to having opportunities in Corona simply because they sell products that consumers need. Uh, so on the fund side, um, slightly different experience. Um, we have 64 active investments. Um, so we had um, you know, quite a few phone calls in the last in the last three weeks, and they went from total panic, um, middle of March, everyone you know trying to understand what it really is that they're facing. Um, you know, panic paired with still you know huge optimism, to week two after you know most countries in Europe locked down, people being a bit more reasonable and um, you know having it under control. And the good news is 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 that you know in the portfolio we haven't seen anyone tank yet. So that shows you that you know, although the crisis is terrible for you know for any industry and and and, and for the planet in general, I think that um, it's not as bad as the press makes it sometimes sound. Right? And I found that in the portfolio now, you know, it crystals out um, who are really good, you know, serious entrepreneurs that are, you know, mindful in terms of what they do, that make you know tough but fair decisions and make those tough and fair decisions quickly. Right. Um, there's one other thing, and those of you that know me well, I'm you know one of the biggest critics critics of the German government, 
I think they're always too slow and far behind on many, many topics. But I have to say, you know, in the last three weeks, I've been proud of how they've managed the crisis because, you know, I think as a, you know, as the largest, um, as the largest economy in Europe, um, you know, we do see that, um, you know, that a healthcare system works, although we strongly overpay in times when there's no pandemic, I would argue, but, um, you know, it now pays off. So, you know, I, I think that governments have made it easier, although they don't help anyone. And, you know, I'm involved in some of the startup discussions and, you know, there's argument they're not doing enough for startups, but let's face it, as an investor, I invest into startups, but governments have more business to take care of than just the industry I invest into. Right? So I'm not upset with them that they haven't found the right, you know, the right source yet on how to deal with, you know, upcoming or growing businesses. But I think in general, I can applaud most of the Gantt countries in Europe because the governments have actually for the first time in a long time acted quickly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And Uli, from uh, Apaleo's perspective, um, what are some of the ways that you've been helping hotels financially through this downturn? Um, as I said before, obviously without compromising your own um, business needs and objectives, has uh, you, you, you yourself have been around um, as well for a number of years, you've gone through a number of different cycles, this isn't new for you, and you've also um, started many different companies. So how have you applied your experience to best navigate this process within Apaleo? As you say, Andre, we I've been going myself through various crises in the past, so it's nothing which, which we have not seen before. Corona is obviously worse than many others we have seen in the past. Um, and I think from, from our perspective, it was very important to react immediately and pretty quickly in, in different ways. One way is obviously uh, we are in the lucky position. We are an online company. So anything we do in, in our company happens really online um, and, and remotely. So all of these channels where we typically communicate with our customers, let it be Slack or, or email or whatever, um, direct chats, they have been open all the time and, and we were in the position to respond very, very quickly to any incoming um, requests to help the customers in different ways, by the way, operationally, um, systems, but also financially. On the, other, um, on the other hand, we have customers in different European countries who are not in Germany um, only, we are in a number of European countries, so they were impacted in different ways. Um, so there was not one fit all, but there were a lot of one to one discussions with the hotel groups and the hotels in those countries and how they reacted to the crisis and what their plans were. Um, and in fact, some of the countries we are working um, in the hotels are still open and operating. So it's really a different situation country by country and the reactions had to be different. Now, um, as we are a subscription-based company only, um, uh, we, we work in annual contracts. Um, so for us, that was another positive point. Obviously, applying this business model is very sustainable, and we are getting our invoices paid annually in advance. So um, it, it's not an ongoing thing we had to um, act on immediately. However, what we obviously did, if we had customers that were running into trouble, um, and we had one-to-one -one discussions with those, and we're trying to solutions to help them over the time. And that could be delaying payments or, or giving them some free time to use the system and so on. But coming back to my original comment, I think more than ever, it turns out to be that those companies that can act really in, on a remote basis and mobile, they can also help the customers in a, in a much quicker way than it was in the past. Um, and we were seeing, we are working with a lot of startups that um, that are on our Paleo store. And actually, we were seeing um, many different ways on how they reacted and how much they were impacted. And it turns out, again, that the ones that are leaner, faster, quicker, more nimble during this type of crisis could also also apply um, things that 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 help them um, become different in, in a much quicker way than others. And some of the bigger companies that are slower to react, um, some of the things they only could do was lay off people or take some other um, uh, apply it some, in some other areas. So I think the, the in the startup scene we have seen a lot of these companies that that were nimble enough to react quickly and help the customers also in different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay. And finally, uh, Moritz, obviously with, with Customer Alliance, you also have business interests in other areas outside of hospitality. Have you seen a, um, um, a, a consistency, if you like, of the way those businesses have uh, reacted and responded? Or is what we're looking at in our, our vertical, hospitality, is it quite unique? 
you know, for us, what we what we realize is that it's similar across the industries. And for us, it was just that uh, hospitality industries were affected first. So basically, uh, we feel like hospitality businesses were two weeks ahead of the curve, right. and then two two weeks later, um, all the other industries also, you know, had starting problems, right? And our measures are very similar to what we already discussed, basically doing two things, right? So we're working with existing customers and once if they call us, we suspend payment and we work with them together. And maybe just to share one action point, which I, which works well for us is that we ask them if they say, hey, I cannot pay, then we say, hey, you don't have to pay for until end of June, for example. But in return, we also ask them to sign for a longer contract. And that actually works quite well. So, um, and customers are very happy about it. So what we now do have, we have around 200 clients who approach us and say, hey, I don't want to pay my invoice right now. But also most of those guys are committed to a longer contract in return. So I think this is something that works quite well for us. So it's like, you know, okay. go to both sides basically, right? Okay, good, good. And then well, I'm sorry, please go, continue. No, and then, then I think what we are seeing is then on the second topic to work with existing customers, we see that slowly, slowly the panic mood is decreasing. So business owners are getting back into this operational mindset. So what we are going to work on now a lot with our existing customers is to see how can they better use our existing customers, but also we're going to give them a lot of features for free for a certain amount of time. And then, you know, just so that they get used to it, and then they, after Corona's over, they can decide whether or not they want to continue using our tools, but really giving them the opportunity to use that down downtime to to work on, on, on some more optimization of some of processes and uh, software tools. Okay, excellent. All right, look, moving on to the next topic, I'd like to actually open this up to, to everybody. So please, anyone chime in uh, initially, because I think uh, you could each add an interesting perspective to this one. When it comes to managing the downturn and adjusting your business models, I think we can all agree that you can essentially write whatever models you had for this year off the table. And given, Sasha, you mentioned before, you wish you'd been more prepared or had uh, seen perhaps a little sooner what was happening with Corona. Um, how have you adjusted now your business models for the remainder of this year? Uh, when it comes to staffing and forecast it, forecasting, um, obviously those things have had to change now. Um, what have been some ways that you've adjusted the business model in light of the issue? Um, and what do you feel could still be done, if anything? I, I think when you look at my own business, um, we're predicting that we're going to be in, involved in this for at least the next six months. Right? We don't expect that um, that markets will fully recover. Um, having said that, um, you know, that's just the worst planning. Right? Um, I do personally believe that um, some of the business that we have seen will come back much earlier. Um, we have seen that Austria and um, Switzerland are, you know, talking about opening um, opening um, up again and have opened up to a certain degree. Germany, hopefully early May. Um, so I do think that, um, that we do business, that we do see business picking up again. But we've also talked to hotels and some of them have said it's, it's you know, it's more cost effective to me to be, stay closed um, during the summertime simply because we, we don't reach enough occupancy to actually pay our operational costs. And it's better for us to, you know, to get government support um, and send people home. So we'll see. So we've, we've prepared from a cash perspective to um, to um, to sustain the next six months. But we're also in a lucky position that uh, we're self-funded. So uh, we're not relying on, on, on external investors and what they believe. You know, now when I change to the investor side, we're sitting on the other side. Um, we do... Um, depending on depending on what the company does and which part of the travel sector they work in and which business model they work, we do prepare them to, you know, to ensure that they have sufficient cash for the next three to twelve months, because there 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 are two issues here. Number one is is the market has to come back for those companies to generate revenue, but also most of them are still startups. They're still in a growing phase. They were unprofitable prior to to the Corona crisis, so they will remain unprofitable after the Corona crisis and. Um, and we're unclear yet what um, venture capital will look like and how willing, um, you know, we as a fund, but also our co-investors are to, you know, to put additional cash in into those startups. So I think those that, you know, had huge burns prior to um, prior to Corona, we advise to make sure that cash lasts much longer. Those that, um, you know, were almost profitable or profitable or, you know, had very small burns um, with those who are less careful. 
because um, we know that once you know once markets open up, they probably have a chance to you know to pick up business again and go back to where they were. But overall, I think you know personally, and that's you know I'm very optimistic. Um, I, I don't think that travel will be affected very long term. There are other areas, um, you know, we don't want to go into those because it's a lengthy discussion. There are other areas that have to worry. But I think that, you know, as long as um, as long as people, you know, as long as people will have money, they will travel simply because, you know, we see this now, you know, people don't like to be locked away and they like to go places. And I think that travel will probably have a good chance to recover in the next 12 months. Right. And, and I mean, if I may pick up there um, from a paleo side, we are obviously one of those apps that are in a, in a major growth phase right now. Um, so we are converting uh, hotel groups from their legacy PMSs and have been doing that for a while. And this year was really one of the major growth years for us and still is, by the way. Um, we, what we did is we are an ongoing um, project of converting a lot of the hotel groups. And this is still happening and ongoing. And actually what is interesting is that none of these groups has really completely put a, a stop on those conversions. So this is still something which is ongoing. However, what we obviously see is um, from the new business, we don't expect a lot to come um, to come this year. We still see a number of chains actually that ha are using that period now to say we are preparing for the time after Corona. And what is important to prepare um, is to be a better position in terms of their tech stack. So I think a lot of people we are talking to are now considering switching or changing their technology to become more modern, more digital, more mobile, more efficient in many ways um, uh, of what they are doing uh, today compared to what they are doing today. So I think um, the way we plan is um, we are, have also the luck that we are funded by uh, internally by friends, family and angels. So um, we took all measures to survive longer with the cash we have, obviously, uh, make sure that, that we also uh, maintain our sustainable business model. Because what Sasha just said is absolutely true. Some th one thing we have seen in the business, especially travel and hospitality, is that those companies that have a sustainable model um, and are efficient in the way they work, um, they will be able to get out of this crisis stronger than other apps and, and, and other to uh, technology and software companies. The, the ones that only put focus on growing, growing, growing without being able to prove behind that they are efficient and can operate efficiently and making money out of it, I think they will be the ones that are struggling and will be struggling much more um, mm -hmm. also for the coming six months or the coming year um, or, or even longer. So, so I think it's a matter of combining different things, running your company in a way that you can survive as long as possible, assuming that the, that the recovery will only happen later this year or even next year. Um, if it's better than that, yes, uh, that would be nice, but I don't think we can count on, on that. And then use this, this time, um, I think, in the best possible way, which means um, having one-to-one -one discussions with the hotel chains that are ready to do things still. That is one important thing. But also, and we'll come to this a little bit later, is prepare on how the travel and hospitality industry will change following the crisis. Because I'm not convinced, and I don't think it will happen, that everything will go back to normal as it was before. I think um, the travelers will change. So the way the hotel guests will travel and they will look at hotels and, and work with hotels and stay at hotels, that will stay significantly. But also on the hotel front, I think the hotel groups and hotels will have to be much better positioned in, in different areas than they were before. And technology is obviously one of the critical areas to, to drive automation and to become much more efficient. Okay, thanks, Uli. Um, Moritz, a question for you now. Um, given what's happened, what would uh, what's been considered the current best practices that you've done to reorganize and protect your overall business model, um, as well as your employees? Because clearly, we've seen you know a lot of uh, employees being furloughed. A lot of people go on short short-term short leave, which in Germany is called Kurzarbeit. Um, what what have you guys done to, to minimize that impact as much as possible, if anything, and, and, and how have you worked and processed that? Yeah, I think we have reacted quite uh, strictly. So we are preparing for a conservative case in our financial planning. So in our financial planning, we are basically assuming zero new sales until September, October. Mm -hmm. And also we are expecting in our financial planning, we are um, expecting a very high payment default of up to 80%. Um, even though right now, looking at current April figures, it looks a lot better. 
Um, in terms of what do we do, is, uh, as you just said, we have this great instrument of short-term lab labor here in Germany. And it's actually a really, really good tool. So we're implementing that tool for a couple of our um, team members. And the good thing is it allows you to reduce work hours and then ramp up gradually again once, once you need it. And because we have that tool, we did not let go anyone in, in our camp company. And we have been very, very open and transparent about communicating that to our team. And we have made sure that we have one consistent message. We over communicate with the team. And everybody who was affected from Pulsa is very, very understanding. And we have not received one single complaint about it. Actually, people are grateful that we are doing short term labor instead of uh, letting people go. Yeah, I think that's been um, a bit the, one of the biggest challenges for a lot of staff. And I think, as you mentioned before, communication is is a critical piece of that and al always ensuring uh, transparency. Um, perhaps, um, James, we could go to you on this one. How has given SightMind has spread across the globe? How has uh, how, how have you guys managed that process and how do you um, control the communication amongst the staff internally so that people are getting um, updated and, 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 and ensuring that they're keeping uh, informed given that they're not going to the office anymore? Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. And, and, and in some ways, I guess the fact that we have so many people spread across the world, um, we had a lot of the tools in place that help us enable that communication as a global team already. Um, I think we we certainly went and had a look at our best practices in that and, and ensuring that the communication is going to the right people at the right time. Um, and, and we're opening that up. Uh, one of the things I know that we miss as a business is that, well, certainly I miss, but uh, and, and talking with other colleagues and, uh, you know, they, those water cooler conversations that you have in the office that they're so used to having. And it's actually trying to keep that um, collaborative, discussion going when it's not scheduled like some of the greatest ideas come out of a corridor chat or something that happened in the kitchen or you know some of the biggest problems are solved that way uh, and so obviously using the tools that we have such as slack and and making sure that you know the we're collaborating across teams more through those platforms rather than just within your own kind of work group um and and you know obviously we're making a lot more use of the uh video conferencing internally uh, whereas usually you know where we do a quarterly business review within the region these are becoming a lot more remote um but but obviously ensuring that these things still happen and that we're keeping a cadence on that communication is, is absolutely key i think one of the biggest learnings there was how quickly we managed to get you know the entire business from being within sort of five main offices to all being at home um, over a 48 hour period was um, was pretty intense. It was pretty insane. Um, it, it was, but, but it was really well managed by, you know, every, every leader and every employee in the team in, across the business. So uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting period for sure. Uh, mm. I think everyone's pretty well settled in it now. Uh, I know some people don't want to go back to the office, but most of us do. Yeah, yeah. But, but I find it really interesting right? because um, the experience that we have is this: people are much more available now than they were before, right? And and especially when it comes to my management team, because they they used to travel quite a lot, right? You used to go and see customers. Now um, they still talk to customers, but because they don't have, have the travel time in between, a day a week is uh, you know is added to their to their available schedule. So it's not only downside in terms of you know, in terms of not being able to travel, there's also quite some upside. And um, and I think it has shown, um, you know, infrastructure providers in all countries how much they still have to upgrade in order to cope with it. Mm. I agree. I think I think it's not even just mm. about the business travel, but the lack of commute that some people have. So I, I commuted uh, 40 miles every day if I wasn't going to London or somewhere else. And that's time I've got back. And our team... I think overwhelmingly have pretty much said that they would like us to look at what our working practices look like after this. And I think we will move to offering fully remote work if uh, if someone wants to do that, because it feels like in this time of um, sort of real stress with all the bad news, helping the team with their well-being just by reducing that travel time uh, has really really helped their their sort of mental wellness 
Yeah. I think there was a lot of talk about home office working in the past and you know, and employers making it available. Now we were forced to make it available. Um, now it is available, right? So we'll see how that changes our working our working culture, you know, after after Corona. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I have more time now. Yeah. Okay, Much great. More. Just just one question we have coming in from our audience, um, which I think is an, a, a good one to finish this particular section on. It's from Sophie Cartwright at Guestline. Thank you, Sophie, for, uh, for, for adding this. Her question is, have you guys seen an uplift in incoming inquiries, even during this downtime? And if so, how are you going to harness the new market without actually putting sales messages out there? She says that this is an area that she's particularly struggling with as there is an appetite from hoteliers to do business, but it's also getting the balance right. And she asks you for your perspectives. Before you answer that, I think this is actually a really interesting point because clearly you guys still need to try to generate a, a level of interest in what you're doing and what you're trying to sell. But given the sensitivity that a lot of us are feeling, given this, the, 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 the impact this has had, Hoteliers' appetite for the messages that they're receiving from vendors perhaps is not as much as it would have been. So this is a great question, and I'd like to perhaps um, start with Julie, if you'd like to, to maybe give your perspective. So I think I said earlier that we had turned off all of our sales messaging, SEO, PPC, LinkedIn, everything stopped, but actually we're starting again next week. So we're launching the new offer. It will be very much, uh, we're here to support you, you know, prepare for the rebound and not, not pushy in, in any way, which isn't, to be fair, really our um, company persona anyway. But I feel like we're starting to have, um, just like we all feel, I think we are all starting to think operationally again is what it said and I think hoteliers are now they've gone through how they're dealing with their team they've gone through any financing decisions they've had to make and over the last two years uh, last two weeks Sophie we have seen an increase in inbound from across the world actually so I think now's the time but I do think you have to be aware of the fact that when you're about to speak to someone and um, it might not be a good time and we really need to make sure that we're asking is this a good time? You know, if you're doing if you're doing a, a a call to follow up, you're going to have to be very sensitive to it. And I still think our messaging must be how we're helping the industry and that it's about us all. We're all in it together. And mm. that's not just trite. I really believe that. I believe that as vendors, we have a huge part to play just now in how the industry recovers. I agree. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I absolutely agree with, with this direction um, Judy just described. I think important for us was to stop any type of sales messaging, cold calls, um, these things going out to hotel groups and hotels and trying to sell the upper Leo system. We pretty much stopped this immediately because we said it's definitely not the right time. I mean, uh, the fun thing is that we saw it with ourselves. We we our we at our company were busy to do the right things for the first um, uh, one to two weeks and, and make sure um, that we, we survive and stay in business. And the same urgency was there for all of our clients the hotels and the hotel groups. Um, so, so I think we, we are very much there. However, what we did pretty much immediately is we thought about um, non-profit uh, initiatives on how to support the industry in the best possible way. Um, so, for example, one thing we did is we started this Hospitality Heroes Initiative where we offered to the communities and, and government and, and cities here in Germany and other European countries, they could use, use our PMS entirely free of charge um, if they were to uh, convert hotels for for some time in, into hospitals. Um, and this was an initiative that was very much appreciated by the hotels and hotel groups, as well as by the communities, by the way. Um, but the hotel groups and hotels said, um, there's very little we can do um, about sales to, to hotel guests now. So what other ways do we have to, to promote our inventory and make sure we at least get still some some reservations and, and some sales to hotel guests going? So I think we, we, we onboard with in kind of 48 hours um, 
uh, over 20,000 rooms to uh, through this initiative and have now 40,000 rooms in Germany and other countries. So in, in case um, uh, hotels are being converted into hospitals, this is a platform that can be used by everybody and ent entirely free of charge. And I think um, this type of initiative, and there are various initiatives worldwide we, we have been um, uh, seeing um, in, in our industry, that really helped the people and they appreciated it because it was not, it had nothing, nothing to do with sales um, or selling your system or PMS. It was really how to help and support the hotels and, and, and the industry. Okay, great. Uh, let's let's move on. There's a let's let's move the conversation now to preparing for tomorrow. Um, because I think this is also a very interesting topic that a lot of people are also considering and how can they best prepare during this downtime to to be in the best position for when things start to pick up again. Um, but before we start with the questions that you've submitted, there's another one question that's come from our audience from Alison Jenkins, um, which I think is a good way to start this. And she says that they've been doing a lot of research with their customers and members to fully understand the market and particularly expected timeframes for their business getting back to some form of normality. So her question is, how are all of you expecting things to move over in the next three to six months? What What is your uh, yeah, how do you see the next three to six months? Who starts? I mean, f from our perspective, we're expecting, um, you know, we're, we're expecting to treat almost every customer like a new customer, because when you look at, um, you know, yes, we have a booking engine in CRS and, uh, and yes, customers are still online today. And yes, you can book future rates, but nobody has paid really any attention to it. Um, and for the hotels, it's almost like a new opening, right? They have to order new food, they have to order new linen, they have to, you know, they have to get everything washed, um, they have to clean the rooms. So it's almost like a new opening. So we're expecting that, you know, country by country, as hotels are being allowed to open up, that we will see a heavy workload. And that's what we're preparing for. So, you know, we're we're preparing our support, we're preparing procedures, or we're overhauling things where we've taken too long in the past, simply because we know that for a short period of time when those markets come online, we're expecting there's a lot of workload for us in order to support our partners and customers to um, to go back to business. And James, from your side? Yeah, so the next, I mean, it, it's tricky because the next three to six months is going to depend market by market, um, you know, what's going to happen as each of those markets open up and how we're going to be uh, managing uh, you know, th those clients through those markets. So I wouldn't say it's a guessing game, but um, you know, a lot of it is wait and see. Yeah, um, I think a lot of markets will also come back at different stages as well because they all went exactly. through the corona cycle in a different way. Um, some countries came in later than others and the bounce back will also probably reflect that. Yeah, I mean, what, what are the, one of the things we're doing is we're very closely monitoring the data that is going through, uh, you know, through through our platforms to understand if there is any trends in certain markets where we can see, you know, more of a pickup and and trying to kind of measure that against the different announcements we get from each of those regions and each of those or each of those governments for each of those regions. So we can say, well, okay, when X happens here, Y happens with the reservations on on, on a future basis in each of those markets. Um, and kind of using that to direct our customers and and, and our teams in terms of where we see um, we're, we're gonna be able to support those customers first. Okay, excellent. Okay, so you already see some markets that are picking up? Um, well, I, I couldn't say that we've seen anything that really relates to anything that's happened, but, but it's it's too soon right now. So uh, the ones that are going to get interesting is where France says, okay, on the 11th of May, um, you know, we're starting to open up X. Well, what will happen to reservations sort of May, June, July onwards over the next three weeks in, in those markets when they make those announcements? So that really only came out earlier this week and the last week. So, um, you know, we start to see. But what we do see certainly is that there is um, positive pickup towards um, probably late summer, early autumn across most of Europe um and and the us of course there's still you know everyone knows there's still negative pickup over the next three months there's more cancellations coming in than than new reservations um and depending on how long that situation continues those future dates can obviously change 
because no one's really booking a non-refundable rate right now. Everybody from a consumer basis is on a wait and see mode. Either they've they booked package, so they're waiting for their their operator to cancel it for them, or they or they're waiting to the last minute to see if actually that travel or that trip is going to happen. So the real trends will come when we see exactly what happens in 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 the next three to six months. But James, a question for you. I mean, you guys have business in China as well, right? Um, so what's happening in China? Not so much, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. You know, most of the business we have in China is from groups that are based outside of China that have one or okay. two hotels. Mm -hmm. Relatively few hotels in China, for, from a site minder perspective. So it's it's and so we'll see slightly different stuff. So we'll only really see the inbound traffic to China. Um, mm -hmm. And so until those borders really open up internationally, it's very hard to gauge a picture on that. I'm always very tentative when we look at the uh, data on China and try and um, kind of see how that would reflect in other regions. I think the real telling ones, as we'll see, is when Spain and Italy, for example, have been the, the, the first ones in, in Europe to start a recovery, to see how the, that data trends there. Can I, can I just say, just getting back to the question, because I think it is really interesting, and I'll talk about it from a vendor perspective. I think we've got to take into consideration that a lot of the people that we are used to dealing with within our customers may not be around. So as a vendor, you're going to have to be very conscious of the fact that your ambassador might not be there anymore, and there's likely to be new staff who haven't used your system before. So we're looking to start a rolling training program through webinars where we're saying to our, saying to our customers, just you know, come on board, um, watch how you can use this tool, use this tool to really understand the value that it adds. Because it feels to me that um, there's a Scottish saying that you're on a sugarly peg, uh, which is, you know, your coat's on a hook that's not very stable. If you're in a situation where your main ambassador isn't there, I think you're at risk of potentially losing that customer. Now, we're also looking into what type of product our customers should offer, right? because yeah. um, when you look at how markets open, um, you know, I um, have a little insight in, into the airlines business, into some destinations and how you know airlines plan to fly there, and the airline traffic will take a while. And um, you know, I'm not sure so, so sure that consumers are comfortable traveling because when you talk to you know people on on the street or you know customers of our customers, um, the one thing that they don't really enjoy very much is sitting next to a person very close on an airplane that they have no idea who that person is. Right? So, you know, like maybe like we've seen after September 11th in the U.S., um, you know, we're expecting a lot of driving business. So that means products that um, that our customers should be selling through through their websites so and OTA should be slightly tailored to that. Right? So, you know, free parking, for example, is more important when you come with your car than when you travel. Within, with an airliner, um, you know, other things maybe maybe more important than they than they were before. So we were trying to figure out with our customers, you know, what is the right product to offer at this point in time and for how long. And that's and I, I think too. I think one additional thing we see from from our customer base, the existing ones, um, but also the new ones, is that they ask themselves how will they continue to run their business um, when they open up again. I mean, we did some check, and fifty percent of our hotels are still open today, so they act in a very mobile, uh, digital way. I would <laughs> say, but I think. Um, there are different aspects. One aspect is how contactless can you work in a hotel and, and for a hotel. So I think a lot of people will ask themselves, if I reopen my hotel, uh, how make I sure? How do I make sure that actually the customers can do a lot of things in in, a, in an online way, uh, even more than before? And that includes online payments, online check in, um, and things like that. So the contact between the the guest and and the the hotel employee is being reduced. But also the question: um, these hotels and many hotel groups will have to operate at a lower occupancy um, level for quite some time now. And, and the period could be as long as one year, six months to one year or even longer. So I think one question everybody is asking today, at least the, the groups we are talking to and our customers is asking today. And so if my occupancy levels will be much lower than before, how can I make sure I still um, make money or at least break even my hotel? Otherwise, I wouldn't reopen it. So I think from a pro product perspective and, and digitalization, it, it will become very important on how you can drive automation into the hotel industry today more than ever before. Yeah. Is there cash for that? I mean, that's a very expensive task for a hotel. Right? I mean, when you look at the vacation rental, for example, they clearly have an advantage. They've been doing online check-ins and you know and mm -hmm. um, and uh, remote list keys for the last two three years minimum. Right? But for I, hotels, I what we've seen is, is there's 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 no cash for the upgrades. 
I, I think this is this is worthwhile a separate discussion. My feeling is that the technology today is available even to do it at very low investments compared to what it was before. I agree with you, Sasha, in, in the past, when you look at the legacy technology that is still out in most of the chains, it was very difficult, cumbersome, took a long time and very expensive to become more digital. I think in today's world, um, there, there are a lot of innovative apps and platforms around which are open and which can drive this as a much, much lower cost and more efficiency uh, without going on site, doing it remote. So there are a lot of ways of driving that. I'm, I'm glad that you asked that question because I think this is one of the big changes we see ahead. These companies that are able to operate this in a mobile way and become much more efficient and help the customer Customers become more efficient. They will be the most successful ones in the industry, I think. Agreed, but there is still hardware change required and that will cost money. And the question is how many of our customers will have that cash right now to invest into such infrastructure? Absolutely, yes. I don't but I think I think we we again as vendors, we, we need to be clear on how you don't need to go the whole way to fully digital to meet some of your guest requirements, right? So, I, and this isn't for me to pitch Crichton right now, but if you think about some of the things they can do simply, removing in-room collateral, I think everything's got to come out of the room. I think right. cleaning is going to have to change. So the cost of that, which means you should extend your less length of stay, less cleaning, all of these things that they can do means that they can reduce contact points without investing significantly in a lot of technology. I think Digital Door Key was coming because of Marriott and Hilton's mandate across their estate. I think by the end of the year, that this year, that was supposed to happen. I think that will slow down. But I think guests will be looking at a hotel and saying, how are you making sure I touch as little as possible? And by the way, how are you making sure that you're sustainable? Because We've seen the impact on our planet of everything stopping. How can we continue that? How can we play our part in staying locked down? Yeah, <laughs> for the planet. Home, but I think it will not be a nice to have. I think the sustainability message is going to move quickly after this. Yeah, and I agree. I think, I think I think what we will be seeing is for a longer period of time, we will be seeing something kicking in, which is I guess called social distancing. That is something which will be happening for a much longer period than, than before. And I think um, that could even last a year or two years or three years or forever, who knows? And I think everybody needs to get prepared for that scenario. I hope it's not forever, Uli, please. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing, right? And I think the Germans are probably a bit more disciplined than um, Southern Europe. I mean, I have spent quite some time in Southern Europe countries. And um, and I I have a feeling that's probably go back to hugging much earlier than we joined. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Okay, just on, on this topic though, I think it's an interesting opportunity for us to go to a question that I think Julie you put forward to the the panel. Um, does the industry's expectation towards vendors change in the future now post COVID nineteen? So we've kind of already touched on it, but I'd like to. Um, maybe hear more directly around that. Do, do, is there going to be a different expectation of yourselves now in the marketplace? I personally, when I travel, I have to say, or maybe I'm too optimistic, I wouldn't expect a lot of change. Right? I mean, uh, in the first three months or four months, and hopefully I can start traveling again early May. It's been the longest I've been locked down in 25 years. Um, you know, I, what I will do is, is I'll, you know, I'll try to keep some distance, um, you know, as long as I see on the news that there's still Corona cases, you know, happening and that Corona is, you know, is still that that infection levels are still there. Um, but I'm not expecting that a hotel, hotels that I stay in would do anything su substantially different. I mean, that's because probably I'm a bit snobby and I stay mainly in four star, five star product where cleaning isn't that big of a challenge. And, you know, where hygiene is, is usually um, is usually good anyway because you know i've arrived at a part of my life where i wouldn't stay in a unclean hotel anymore i would just check out i i think if we see change then the consumers expect more you know more more cleaning um cleaner rooms uh, more hygiene um you know they're getting used to the fact now that there is a dispenser at the beginning of a you know at the entrance of a supermarket um i'm pretty sure that you know you would have need to have something at, at reception so i think those things will probably change but as a traveler uh, besides being careful initially, I, I'm not expecting a lot of change that needs to happen for hotels for me to stay there. I think okay. was, was the question more towards the vendors? 
Yes, I, I, was, I was interested in whether you guys thought that um, the... I think the I think the fact is I believe that hotels will now understand that they're going to have to look at their tech stack and embrace it and understand how it can make a difference because their guest is really going to force it on them because they're going to want to do more themselves without touching things. And so I was interested in in how you guys thought that would make hotels look at us. Because you know, sometimes there's still a there's still a group of hoteliers who believe that the only way to serve a guest is to do it face-to-face. -face. Hospitality is all about that face-to-face -face interaction, which I don't disagree with, but I disagree with the fact it has to be done at check-in or check-out. I think you should let your, your guests choose when they consume your hospitality and how they consume it. So I was interested in whether you thought that could change how hospitality providers viewed us. I think, I think um, look, I think it will change from two. Pers I think it will change from two perspectives. One perspective is clearly that um, that there is a certain uh, number of five star chains and hotels, as Sasha says, that will continue operating differently, and they will see how they how they will have to make their money. But I think Julie, you're absolutely right. Um, I think a personal service can also be delivered via a mobile phone, via a tablet, online, and in different ways. And I think this is where a lot of the hotel groups will adapt in the future to say, you know, um, I want to serve my customer in the best possible way, but what is the best possible way under current times? And that could shift a lot of the um, procedures we are seeing at hotel level really um, on a mobile level. And, and I think this is a, a major drive for efficiency. And I, I I disagree with Sasha there. I think um, the change in the industry will be much more radical as, as, as we expect it today. And I think it has to be much more radical because there are a lot of groups and hotels that were not making a lot of money during splendid times we had over the past couple of years. And we are now in a crisis and will not have splendid times for a number of years to come. So I think all of them have to act or maybe go out of business or sell their business and, and do things differently. The other thing I'm seeing is, and that's the second point. Um, when when we were used in hotel business to very cumbersome projects on site. So let's assume you would install a new technology, a new product, a new system. Typically, we were expecting to have somebody on site that, that would do installation, take the interfaces live, do trainings, do live coverage, um, do that for a while. And it was long and very costly projects. I think the expectation from the hotel industry to the vendors will be to shift a lot of this also to, to online onboarding processes. And I think the, the one that can fully cover that um, totally uh, mobile will, will again be in a much better position and, and they will be the ones the customers will want to work, uh, the, the hotel guests will, uh, the hotels would want to work with in the future. Yeah, I think there will be a change in, te in technology. I don't think it's driven by Corona. I think Corona is maybe enhancing it, right? I mean, it's not like that mm -hmm. lot, lots of hotels wouldn't mind to upgrade technology, but let's face it, a lot of the startups out there, the technology that they proclaim how it works, the functionality isn't quite there yet. Right? Some of them are still at, at a basic level and they will progress and I agree. And that's why we invest into, into the tech space in travel. But um, let's face it, I mean, you know, legacy systems at this point in time can not be replaced by online players in all aspects of travel. They still, you know, still require a few, you know, a few years. So if I think if there is a pressure on, on the travel tech side, if you know, the smaller companies or startups like us want to survive is this, we need to drive that in innovation in terms of you know, allowing digitalization much quicker than we originally had planned right so you now we're looking at you know what else do we need need to develop right now to further you know to further help uh, I, more think time. That, uh, huh? I think i uh, just uh, just wanted to add uh, three thoughts before coming back to the question what will change in the mindset of uh, of people who are buying stuff generally right and i think there are, I, I see three changes that are currently going on in, not only in hoteliers but in the society right first one is that people are now thinking about their supply chain again right so i think what will happen is that we will get a lot more questions about how stable is our business are we going to be there um, also in the long term how are we always able to to meet our slas etc etc so i think a lot of people that i'm talking to are now lo looking very closely to their supplier 
And um, also a lot of people I'm talking to are very fearful that uh, they think a lot of their suppliers will actually go bankrupt um, um, soon. So m making sure that you position yourself and talk about how stable you are, I think that is what, something that uh, will be very important. Yeah. And then, then also another trend that I see, a trend which I don't really like, but you know, it's all about, even now in German newspapers, it's all about support your local dealers, support your local businesses. So what that means for us is that it's accelerating one, one thing that I already saw before is that um, a lot of people that I talk to, they want to speak to a French company, they want to speak to a German company, to an American company, etc. So um, I think it's very important that or like what we are trying to do is that we keep on investing um, into local, local people and to exactly. come across at that German player, at that French player, et cetera, so, so that they have the impression that we are also local, right? And, and the third point I wanted to add is that, uh, in fact, actually, that I like is that um, people are now in the public are talking about economy. People in the public were not, like, like normal people, were not so much talking about economy. And what I like about it, they, they are questioning, again, what is the impact of businesses on the environment, on social matters, etc.? So I think um, this term of greenwashing is becoming less of a problem. Now, more and more people will choose their suppliers depending also on what, what are the stuff that I, they are doing outside of you know, generating money. How are they contributing to the society? So I think that's also something uh, that will change. Excellent. All right, guys, thank you. Just one one final question from the audience before we move into the next and final category of the uh, session today. It's from Daniel Hertzberg, um, and he's asking, do you believe that guests are going to be raising their expectation on the facilities providing clear and visual information regarding the indoor air quality, as well as providing uh, PPE amenities? Um, and I, I guess I would also add to that, do you feel that there may be where, if any, if anywhere, would technology play its role in that? I, I think, I think, uh, I think if guests are arriving at a hotel expecting PPE uh, and air quality, they'll not be travelling yet. I don't, I don't think it will go as far as that. But I think levels of cleanliness and you reassuring your guests about what you're doing to make sure that it can't spread and reducing touch points that will be important but i think i think if i arrived at a hotel and they gave me ppe i would leave yeah i, 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 think, I think it's going to be a lot more about the communication as well i think um you know I, 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 I think the guest expectation is going to be that hotels are communicating better and more frequently about you know, not just their facilities, but, you know, about the cleanliness of the hotel and uh, or, you know, the, the, the additional services provided or, or what uh, processes they're putting in place to ensure guest safety when they're there. And, you know, that, that's certainly going to be the case uh, in the initial period once borders start reopening and hotels are going to have to be a lot more sensitive to the different cultural um uh, regions that are traveling into their hotel in terms of how they've been affected or you know how, how those cultures deal with those different pieces like we already know that in asia people were wearing face masks uh, a lot of the time anyway and and that's going to be something certainly probably over the next six to, to nine months is going to be more apparent in, in other regions across europe and, and, and the us and the world mm -hmm. um, but certainly being able to communicate with those guests regularly being able to answer those questions within their local language is going to become more important to reassure those those travelers either before they've booked or you know after they've booked and before they stay i i actually think if, if i can add one thing i hope that it finally resolves the unclean um unclean yeah. remote controls and hotel rooms right that we find a solution oh, 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 oh. Um, <laughs> Besides that, what, what I do expect is, and that's probably in, in, in pre preparation for hotels as well. I mean, you know, reviews and, you know, and consumer feedback and guest reviews have become, you know, very important in the last couple of years anyway. And I think that more consumers will now focus on, you know, on, on reviewing, um, you know, guest reviews even more. And those that haven't done so in the past probably will start doing so more often. So I think there will be more workload for hotels to actually deal with, you know, online rep reputation than there was before. 
Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So let's um, let's start to move across now to the consumer behavior side of the of the discussion. Um, and I'd like to open up uh, to all of you the following uh, type of question. How long do you think it's going to take before tech companies and hotels have built up enough money again to start to spend it? What, <laughs> what, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a how long is a piece of string kind of question. But, um, you know, you guys, you're all experienced at this. this, is, this you're not new in this game. Um, yes, it's a new environment we're in, but based on your experiences and your 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 knowledge, there must be some kind of um, expectation. There must be some kind of mud map that you've already started to create. So, uh, Moritz, perhaps if you'd like to start. Well, I just want to add, I'm the guy here. Who, uh, this is my first economic crisis, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the club. <laughs> oh, morning. Um, so, but what what we as what I think it's a lot of the psychology, right? I actually know a lot of companies that still have a lot of money; they're just not spending it right now. Yeah. So it's very important that people are get back into the mood that they get. They know when will the economy. They know that the plan is. They know the plan about the lockdown coming down. That is the point when people are willing to spend it now, because again, a lot of companies have money, but they are not spending it right now because they want to hold it. And I think once we have a plan, a clear plan, that will get it will get easier. And I suspect that it will once hotels are open, it will still take six to eight weeks until they have enough cash again about making new investments. So I do not I expect I do not expect a big bang. I expect like a slow, gradually recovering. I, I do expect it takes longer for hotels to collect enough cash in order to, you know, make massive investments. So, you know, we're not expecting that any of our customers, you know, because we're always trying to upsell. And I'm not expecting that any of our customers are going to take us up on it unless we're willing to come their way and maybe give it to them for free for a period of time. Mm. Um, you know, I, I hope and I truly believe that you know, travel will come back quicker than some other industries because people just love to travel and you can't keep them home. But I do think that, you know, we... We, we are not necessarily the most cash rich industry anyway. We always get deflected away by those large companies that have raised 60 million, 100 million, 150 million. We look at a booking.com and a Google and what have you. Um, but you know the majority of the of, of the travel players. Let's face it, we're not so cash rich in good times. Right? So for us to recover from this will probably take a bit longer than um, than this year. I agree. Reopening, reopening a hotel F&B is going to cost a lot of money. If you think about it, everything in the kitchen will be out of date. So you're you're restocking your larder as well as your food. Your your number of covers is going to be significantly reduced. You may increase your room service, but your room service menu probably has to change. You're changing all of your self furnishings or going through an extensive cleaning. I mean, there is you know probably new uniforms, different um, cleaning materials having proper companies coming in to do a big deep clean. I think it will take a long time for hotels to get to the point where they feel comfortable that they've built rebuilt their war chest, particularly when we don't understand how many recurrences of this we're going to have. So I, I think investment will be, from a hotelier's perspective, will be limited and they'll be looking at what can help them either uh, make their guests feel comfortable or increase, increase guest spend. The first time I sold technology into the travel space, a uh, hotelier that also did uh, consultancy for hotels and others said, you have to learn um, a few things. And number one is there's a payment order in the hotel. And that payment order is coffee first, because otherwise the guest is upset. Rolls for breakfast, because otherwise the guest is even more upset. And then clean sheets, because otherwise you won't stay in your hotel. If there's cash left after those three, you can find out which order you're in then. Yeah. I think there's I mean, going to be a, a, a prioritization. One, one, one process that goes oh. on that's all right uh, there'll be a prioritization process that goes on which might um counteract that a little bit sasha in the sense that they need to get guests first right before they can give them coffee bread they rolls and that. clean their sheets but they right? forget that um they, but they, they this is this is unprecedented times and they're going to be starting at, at, at point zero so there will certainly need to be some investment in marketing and and maintaining their online strategy uh, and understanding where those guests are going to come from first um but they won't whether, pay you, you know, 
but they won't they don't have to pay you until that guest arrives right you pay booking come after the guest has already stayed there right Correct. so that's the easiest invoice to forget about when you have a crying customer you know for coffee in the lobby <laughs> But they're going to need to obviously make sure that they're in the right places for for that, and 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 there is an investment in their own marketing to, um, you know, when demand ter- returns, it is the biggest players that see it first, um, you know. So from 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 that respect, it, it, Google will understand where the demand is coming from before anyone else, and, and uh, yeah, making, <laughs> yeah, and they get paid, they they get paid for the clicks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. I mean, one thing we have seen during the past crisis in travel and, and hospitality, and there were quite a few over the years, um, I think in, in many um, instances, actually, the travel was picking up faster than we were expecting it at the time. Um, so I, I think I would agree with, um, with Sasha here that we might see a pick up in people traveling both for business as well as, as for leisure faster than we can imagine. There's quite some money still out there to do trips. People want to meet their customers again. So I think that side could, could pick up again, and that obviously would increase the occupancy levels at, at, the, at the hotels as well. Um, but our expectation is that um, for quite some while, the, the, the hotels will be very cautious about where they spend their money in terms of investments. And I think they'll spend it in ways that are smarter than before. So they will think about whatever drives my business in a better way. Um, and, and that could be different things, by the way. It's not only technology, but could be other things as well. That that are areas I, I will definitely invest in because one of, the, one of the things we have seen before crisis, and we do not expect this to go away, is the lack of skilled personal in, in hotel industry. I think something which in addition to, the, to Corona will experience over the next couple of years more than ever is that the the hotels and hotel groups will not find sufficient trained staff to to put into their properties so i think um one thing is how how to be how to make it the whole operations leaner in many ways and that applies to technology software and different areas as well so i think it's much more about self learning um how how you can train systems that are easier to use than in the past going away from those complex operations because if you really look at this this is what costs a lot of money um, at the hotel level to run those operations that are really complicated and complex so there will be a drive uh, for becoming much leaner much nimbler in in many ways and focusing on certain um, market segments um, in terms of who is coming to my hotel Excellent. Just just bringing it back to some comments that I'm looking on uh, as we're streaming live. There's an excellent comment here from Claire Sawyer, who is the head of marketing at Book Assist. And she's basically said that the best guess is still just a guess. And yeah. that's been um, agreed to by uh, Maroni Van Arden and who says, yes, basically, you're right. We can't compare this to any other events because essentially this is the first pandemic. Now, with all of that said, um, I don't think any of us really know how this is going to bounce back because we've never had this type of environment before. We are really guessing. But I think um, for us to sit here and to say, look, domestic's going to come back first, corporate's going to come back first, no one really knows. And um, I I don't think anyone here is saying, yes, we're the litmus test, we know all of the answers. But I think what what is very important is that people have an opportunity to be able to uh, convey their their ideas and their thoughts based on experiences that they've had. Um, We spoke with the hoteliers as well um, last week, as I mentioned to you before, and the feedback that we got from them was essentially that they felt domestic's going to return first because no one really knows how the markets are going to open up. And we've, yep. we touched on it a little bit. At mm-hmm. what point will each of the markets open up? So essentially, once countries open up their, their own borders internally, then domestic travel will be supported. And that in that, in that sense, that theory holds some water. Um, but I guess coming to the next question, which is really just the ramp- one comment, just one yeah, comment on that, please. Right? And, and that is that is the market we need to have up first again. Because, Absolutely. You no, know, what's over a lot of times is, and especially when you discuss travel, travel experts, is, is there is still more travel in countries than there is travel coming into countries, right? So yeah. I think for all of us on the call here, it would be a good thing to see that inbound comes back first because that's yeah. the you know the majority of our business. 
Exactly, yeah. exactly. But the the, the 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 next question, I think it was um, from yourself, Moritz. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it's essentially is the hospitality is typically always the first to lock down given these types of situations? Um, is it? Do you feel going to be the last to ramp up due to economic, social as well as legal restrictions? So, because this is a unique situation, yeah. it will have a unique bounce back. So it was interesting because uh, Sasha and I we had a separate discussion about it, and uh, if I recall correctly, Sasha said, "Hey, typically uh, hospitality is the industry that bounces back first. But now, when I look at current regu regulations, right, and what's happening here in Germany, I feel like actually hospitality hotels will be the industry that is opening or bouncing back the last, to be honest, mm -hmm. at least opening yeah. the last. So I feel I feel like the industry was the first to lock down and will be the last to open." I mean, we have, seen this this in, we have seen this in Germany and, and different states in Germany. What was announced over the past few days underlines exactly what, what Moritz just said. I mean, um, a, a lot of hoteliers were hoping, and we read a lot in the news today and yesterday, were hoping that they could open up hotels and restaurants as well again um, as soon as any other business. But this is not the case. I mean, the, the politicians are pretty uh, strict about this will happen only in a few weeks after everybody else else is up and running again because the risk are so high uh, is so high so i would expect that um, that that this time we will see that the hospitality industry will suffer much longer from being locked down than most of the other industries um, and then when it will pick up again it will take some some while to come back to decent occupancy levels yeah. if you look at inbound travel if, if you look at internal travel within countries right i mean uh, let's face it i mean most hotels don't have a necessity to lock down at this point in time because they cannot be open for leisure but they can be open for business and the more business that we open the more you know the more travel activity associated with that business will go along so i, I do think that we probably see you know transactions happening um you know sooner than we will hear on the press that hotels are being officially opened um but yes, I mean, this time, um, you know, nobody can travel um, and um, travel will be the last thing to open. Unfortunately, that hits us. Can I, can I just say this, just back to what your previous commenters were saying, this completely and utterly depends on whether we have a, a second wave or not. So I think if we can manage to contain this and we reopen around about the summer um, I, and there's not a second wave, I think that domestic travel will recover well. I don't think any hotel will be running with the occupancies they've had, but I hope it will be enough for them to, to get their staff back and get into the way of it and start to build up that war chest. If there's a second wave somewhere, I think the hospitality industry will be set back significantly. Yeah, well, no, I think that's something we haven't really expected or considered too greatly is that that second wave. And no one really knows yet if that's going to happen. I think that's where we're also watching China very closely. It's, it's also, I mean, when you look at when you look at the way that this this Corona, you know, situation is being dealt with, I think this is the first time that we had as much information as population and then we and I had before, because when you look at the swine flu, which is only, you know, a little bit over 10 years ago, we have more deaths during the swine flu than we have today. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying Corona is not bad. Don't, don't get me wrong, because I don't want to be in the press saying, you know, Sasha says Corona is not bad. Corona is really bad. But we have more information you know, available. So what I'm hoping what we do with that information is, is we contain it much better than we did with the swine flu. Right. Yeah. I mean, I remember the last times of the swine flu, you know, I had an office in India and, you know, 300 people in India. And, you know, they almost took me apart walking through the airport before I was allowed to enter the country. I, the last time I traveled was four weeks ago, you know, and there was in some countries who were already locked down. Nobody took my temperature at the airport. No. Right? So I think that, you know, by having more information available, the public being better informed, and I think that, you know, social media and YouTube and online channels, um, you know, help keeping people more informed, which also makes them more aware. And I hope that that awareness will not break, you know, you know, end up in a second breakout simply because people are being more careful than they probably were 10, 12, 15 years ago through better information. But one thing I would say is I don't I don't agree that corporate business is going to go back to the levels it's had because we're able to do this and my business is running fine on the Zoom. I'm not saying it's ideal, but I think a lot of businesses will see that transactions have happened 
without the cost of travel. So I, I when I'm talking to hoteliers, I'm talking to them about, um, you know, if you're very reliant on corporate travel, then I think it's a good idea to look at how you can be attractive mm -hmm. to other segments. And, and I think I you've, got got corporate the, travel. you've got to look at the events business around corporate travel because that's what drives the vast majority yep. of corporate travel. And as long as that, that flywheel of events does start turning again, then then corporates have to travel because yeah. you know effectively that that that's where it happens. So I think there will be a resurgence when the events industry is able to get back up to full pace. But of course, with social distancing and and the limitation of large gatherings, like all of that has to be relaxed before we can yeah. even look at that uh, that larger chunk of the. Um, a corporate travel market uh, otherwise the the transient business travel i see that being a lot less um, yeah. i say a lot less I, I see it being reduced certainly as people look at the efficiencies of zoom and 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 also you know there's corporate responsibility in terms of asking your team to go and travel and whether they're comfortable with it whether you're comfortable with the risks as well so i can see that being reduced certainly in in, in the short to mid period but obviously when events happen, they do happen. Yeah. Events happen, and I agree. Also, and, and, then events... also, and then also, I think, opens up a lot of opportunities for hotels actually to question what they did in the past in terms of market segments, customers, how they were running their business and different other things. So I guess um, we will see also more dynamic hotels. And when I say this, I mean, it's not purely hotel rooms they'll be selling in the future. They'll consider also using their hotel rooms for other purposes, whatever, long stay, hybrid business models, apartments. There are a lot of different uh, market segments actually, which will drive hotels to think about differently about their business as it was in the past and it will be in the future I, I do think that corporate travel will change slightly but then also what you know what we have a tendency to forget is um you know not all businesses can operate like we can i mean when you look at the entire construction side you look at manufacturing you look at distribution chains um to logistics transportation there that's all corporate travel as well right? and and i think there will be you know hardly any impact on those but you know, I personally, um, you know, I always thought customers wouldn't sign with me on a video call. I found out last week some do, right? So, you know, <laughs> I can save cost and save time. I'll definitely try and explore that. That's for sure. Excellent. All right, guys, listen, we are coming up to uh, the end of the session. Um, thank you all so much for, for joining us and for taking part in this. And to the audience who tuned in to watch and listen, thank you very much for your time and also for your questions and comments. Um, we really appreciate that. And um, we uh, really are, are, are us at Tech Talk Travel are a little bit undecided whether we continue with this collective series, whether or not it's something that we that that is going to add value to the industry as such, because we we're very cognizant of what we do. We'd like to always try to add value to to uh, the audience, and uh, that's why we're kind of focusing on these disciplines in terms of the collective per se. So, um, if this is something that you as vendors or as technology providers is something that you'd like to see continue then we're certainly very happy to support that and to, to facilitate that so please let us know uh, reach out to us uh, directly or through our through the comments in LinkedIn as well uh, we will be leaving the recording of this also on our website so that people can go back uh, historically and, and review this and listen to it in, in case they miss this um, so guys once again thank you so much uh, we really really do appreciate your your time today. I know you're all going through your own uh, challenges and, and uh, you're being uh, tested perhaps in ways that none of us had expected. So we do appreciate it. And um, yeah, with all of that said, have a lovely weekend. Have a great weekend, everybody out there. And uh, you too. all the Stay best. Stay positive. Exactly. Stay positive. Thank, Stay positive. Thank, you. Always the silver Thanks, thank you very much. Very nice to see you guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, bye -bye. everyone. Bye. bye.